Hey there, th this is Dr. Evan Osar, founder of Fitness Education Seminars, the movement-based solution to the healthcare crisis, and author of the Corrective Exercise Solutions to Common Hip and Shoulder Dysfunction. Thank you so much for joining me on this part three of three webinar and the topic that's so pertinent to so many of us as fitness professionals, as well, and more importantly, to our clients on back pain, the myths, misconceptions, and corrective exercise management. And we know back pain is probably the number one dysfunction we're going to see in our clients. So I want to discuss with you how you can be a solution that your clients need and want and how to disseminate between so much of the information that's out there regarding back pain and some of the solutions so that you can make informed decisions and help your clients make informed decisions about how best to work with their specific conditions. So let's get started. If you're like me, you're probably frustrated with all the information and all the different methods and all the different individuals talking about low back pain out there. So again, in doing this webinar, I want to help sort of sort through some of this misconceptions and some of this frustration that we often hear about in this industry. Everyone seems to have the answer and are oftentimes very happy to tell you about it. And everybody seems to have a solution. And again, they're very happy to tell you about their method of dealing with low back pain. And again, just to let you know, Nobody has all the answers that's going to stop every single one of your clients, individuals, including me. So take the information, use it, but keep an open mind as we go along. Even the experts don't agree. Experts will say, just work through it. Others say, you must brace like crazy. Everybody seems to have an opinion. So again, it gets real frustrating after a while. So what I want to help you do again is disseminate through some of this information so that you can make sense of a lot of these things that the experts seem to be arguing about and actually look at the fact that a lot of them are probably saying a lot of the same things. So what are they saying that can help you help your clients? So there will be no shouting or preaching. There will be no guru mentality. So I don't want you to leave here thinking that I have all the answers because I don't, but I want to present to you a, a discussion about the common causes of low back pain that many individuals don't think about that if you can help people solve this one in particular thing that we're going to talk about during this webinar, you will help a lot of people solve their low back pain condition. So all I ask is, is that you keep an open mind. Understand and apply the principles. I'll give you the three takeaways at the end of this webinar so that you can develop the best practices to develop yourself into the expert that your clients need, want, and will pay for. So like I said, all I ask is that you keep an open mind. So let's get started. So what are the keys? Well, we're gonna take a look at the research that's out there. There's a lot of great research out there. So I wanna share with you just a little bit of that research. We wanna look at the real world application. What do you do with your everyday, the general population clientele? It doesn't mean this information doesn't apply to the elite level or the high level, high functioning individual like a professional athlete. However, you're going to treat the general population much different than you're going to treat an elite athlete because you cannot get away with the same strategies that you train an elite level athlete with that you do a general population clientele. I'm a chiropractic physician and I deal with low back pain the most in my office and I'll tell you right now, the strategies that we're using to train high level athletes that we're using on our general population client are actually contributing to their back pain. We'll talk about that as we go along so that you stay relevant. So you, so you apply the research, the real world application, and the relevancy to your clientele, the general population clientele, so that you get results, you can be that solution that they need and want. So why talk about back pain in the first place? Well, it's the second most common cause of visits to medical doctors. Common colds being number one, and most likely, or I should say it is, the most common cause of visits to chiropractic physicians like myself. 31 million individuals every single day experience low back pain. At the cost of over $50 billion per year is spent on treating low back pain alone. We have a healthcare crisis in, in this country and I've said it before, the fitness profession is at the forefront of dealing with this dilemma. And we'll explain to you exactly why that is. And you probably already have an idea of what that is as we go through this webinar. 
Before we get started, we have to look at the most common myth of low back pain and how sometimes we can actually be part of the problem in the fitness industry. Because once upon a time, we believe that the sun revolved around the earth and that the world was flat. But we learned that both those things are false. So what is the big, biggest and most common myth of low back pain? Individuals have back problems because of a weak core. Or another way of saying it is the stronger the core is, the better it is in preventing low back pain. Both these statements are false. Look at this individual, professional athlete that I evaluated that has chronic low back pain. If you look at his erectors, massive, massive erectors here. Massive mass here. Massive upper traps, middle trap, lower trap mass. Massive lats. No problem with strength here. Very strong individual. But look what you see when he starts to bend forward. What do you see here? Again, you still see the massive low back mass or the erector mass, but what you see is he does not have much anterior pelvic tilt and he gets increased lumbar flexion. So what is the problem? It is not strength. Creating more core strength for this individual will not prevent his low back pain. In fact, it's actually causing his low back pain because his erectors are getting thicker and bigger he was an abdominal bracer as well, so he's over-contracting and utilizing his oblique system, his abdominal obliques. He, being stronger will not help this individual. So what will help an individual like this and what will help most of our clients and strength is not what it is. So what is it? Most individuals have poor stabilization strategies. Here's a, a general population client of mine. Look at his low back erectors with the arrows pointing. Massive erectors for a client that has never lifted a weight in his life. But look what happens when he stands on a single leg and we're asking him to, to be a little bit less stable. Can he stabilize well? No. Look at the massive contraction he gets of his lumbar erectors and even on his lats on his opposite side as he tries to stabilize a single leg. Here's a client that had no low back pain when he played soccer once a week. He had no low back pain with walking or sitting. He had low back pain if he stood too long. And if you look at these erectors right here, you can see what happens to his erectors or what has been happening to his erectors is he's overutilizing his erectors to create stability for his low back. And you can see what happens once he asks his, his body to be a little bit less stable, like when he's standing, and especially standing on one leg. His, mass, his erectors increase in tone. He never lets this tone go. Developing more back strength is not going to help this individual. Teaching him how to develop a better stabilization strategy will help this client. So how do we develop better stability? We, always have, we often have this argument in our industry, bracing is better than hollowing, hollowing is better than bracing. If you think about what is hollowing, hollowing is just pulling your belly button in towards the spine. Bracing is more just bearing down and or gripping everything, maybe not bearing down, but also co-activating the abdominals and the low back. So similar, not too dissimilar to what our individual in this image is doing. This is a mod of, this is actually a dysfunctional brace. This is more what we consider back gripping. Basically, this argument is a moot argument. It's basically saying what I learned is better than what you learned. Well, let's take a look at this difference between hollowing and drawing, hollowing or drawing in and bracing. Because if we're going to have this discussion about hollowing or drawing in versus bracing, there's only one population we can look at that's unbiased by what they've learned, body aesthetics, core training, and that's our child population. If you look at my cute little niece here, you can see she's in a model, she's actually in a plank position, so she's loaded position, and you see no abdominal hollowing and actually no bracing. And it looks almost as if she's pushing out. If you see this cute little guy over here, as he's lifting his legs, so he's actually loading his, his core, again, no drawing in, no hollowing, no bracing, just big belly breathing. So he's performing what we call a modified brace. Here's what we're talking about between the difference, be or the difference between modified bracing and drawing in. When we activate three-dimensionally, we get a three-dimensional activation of the and co-activation of the entire 
trunk musculature, so the abdominals, the erectors, the QL, the lats, the psoas, all the muscles, and we have a good hoop-like tension on the spine, this being the spine right here. When we draw in, we actually narrow and, and hollow out or, or decrease the space, the A to P dimension of the trunks and abdominal wall, therefore decreasing the stability of the spine. Another way of looking at it is thinking about a tent and guy wires and the muscles like guy wires. When the muscles are this distant apart, the tent or our spine, the rod of, of the tent is equivalent to our spine. When we have a modified brace, we have a further distance of the abdominal wall from the spine, we have better stability. Just think about the guy wires of a tent. The further they are away from the central pole, the more stable the tent is. The more close the guy wires, the less stable the tent is. And that's what happens when we draw in. We bring the guy wires closer to the spine, therefore decreasing the functional stability of the spine. And here's what it looks like in function. A modified brace where the client is co-activating the abdominal wall without bracing down. So co-activation and bracing are not synonymous. We have co-activation of the entire abdominal wall, and she's still able to breathe. And that's really the differentiation. She's able to co-activate and still breathe three-dimensionally. She doesn't lock herself down. When she hollows, she raises the rib cage up, and now she's forced to breathe up into her upper respiratory system. We want a modified brace or a co-activation of the entire system with the ability to breathe three-dimensionally as a client holds this modified brace. Why do, three, why do things go wrong in the first place with our system? Well, there's many common reasons as we've discussed in, uh, in the other webinars, so feel free to check them out. But briefly, trauma, car accidents, falls, surgeries, GI inflammation, the way we learn how to do exercises, the cues of gripping, pulling in, bracing, all these things will create dysfunctions of our core. And of course, stress and body image are huge causes of core dysfunction. And we've talked about that in the last webinars. But what happens? What's the effect of this dysfunction on our system? Well, if you think about the, the body essentially and the core musculature, for example, as two different muscle systems. And again, this does not mean they're individual. They work together. But if we think, but there's a specific effect of a deep muscle system and a reaction of the deep muscle system versus the super mus superficial muscle system. And we've seen that over and over again in the research that pain, dysfunction, altered movement patterns, surgery affects the deep stabilization system differently than the superficial muscle system. What's the effect of these things? the deep muscle system becomes inhibited. We have decreased proprioception, we have decreased movement efficiency. In other words, we have decreased motor control. What happens to the superficial muscle system? It becomes overactive, and that's what we saw in the client earlier, the spasm and muscle guarding. These clients are, have an inability to turn their muscles off when they don't need it. And that's why so many of our clients have discomfort when they stand for too long or are are in a sedentary position, like sitting for too long. They have overactivity of these muscles and they cannot turn them off at rest. Our job as fitness professionals is just as important to teach clients how to activate the, the right muscles, which we're very good at. We don't do such a great job in teaching clients how to turn those muscles off when we don't need them. Again, this is the biggest thing that you can take home from this webinar is get your clients to relax when they do not need their muscle system. And a great assessment for that is you lie your client down and just give them a little wiggle of their torso, their neck. And when I say wiggle, you don't jar them, but just gently wiggle their rib cage, wiggle their legs, wiggle their shoulders, wiggle their neck, and see how mobile they are. When you are relaxed on lying on the floor or a massage table, you should be very relaxed. And if you check most of your clients, especially the ones with chronic low back and or neck or shoulder pain, you'll find that they don't relax very well. They are not very mobile when they're lying down. And stretching, as we talked about in the last webinar, will not improve this. We have to teach our clients a better stabilization strategy. So what does this look like in function? Well, when we have a good functioning system, our clients can load their head up. 
well, we're not going to load our client's head up, but our client should be able to load their head up or an individual should be able to load their head up and be very stable and not have it load crush their spine. Unfortunately, when we have clients that look like this, like many of our clients, if we were to load up their head, they would essentially crush their spine. These clients are screaming out, please help me develop a better stabilization strategy. So just how do we do that? Well, let's look at the three principles that govern movement. And these are the principles that make up the integrative movement system. Principle number one, respiration. You must improve your client's breathing before you do anything else. Breathing is the number one way to stabilize the spine. We already know that the two primary functions of the diaphragm, or we know the one primary function of the diaphragm is respiration. The other one is stabilization. The diaphragm is a huge muscle of stabilization. When you do not breathe right, the diaphragm will give up its stabilization function to breathe. And the more dysfunctional the breathing is, the more dysfunctional your stabilization is, that, that then requires you to overutilize other muscles of respiration, like your accessory muscles of your neck, shoulders. Again, the most common cause for the forward head and forward shoulders is faulty respiration. So, to line up our torso appropriately, and if you look, think about their torso, let's talk about the thoracopelvic canister. The thorax, the thoracic spine, lumbar spine, and pelvis. The three diaphragms must be aligned. The thoracic inlet, the respiratory diaphragm, and the urogenital diaphragm, also known as the pelvic floor. So these three areas should be lined up, whether we're looking from the front or the side, and this allows us to maintain the alignment that we need to breathe right, and of course, stabilize our spine appropriately. When we do that, we're able to create intra-abdominal pressure, and it's the intra-abdominal pressure that creates the ability to stabilize our spine. So we teach our clients how to breathe right three-dimensionally. We teach, teach them how to align and centrate the spine. We teach them how to activate their core appropriately so there's no hard bracing down. There's no gripping. There's no drawing in. It's a modified activation, alignment, and then we teach them how to coordinate activation and respiration. And that's really the key right here, the coordination of activation and respiration while maintaining this alignment that gives us the proper stabilization. And here's the real key. is the benefits of intra-abdominal pressure and that coactivation is the ability to stabilize and decompress the spine. Not only are we more stable when we can develop proper intra-abdominal pressure from breathing properly, but we're able to decompress the spine. And when we decompress the spine, we take a lot of that pressure off the accessory muscles the superficial muscle system, and we take the pressure off the low back. This is a key to solving low back in the majority of our clients. Once we've done that, then we teach the clients how to maintain centration. Centration is maintaining an optimal axis of rotation, whether we're stabilizing in a, in a static position or in moving. When we maintain an optimal axis of rotation, we can stay long and we rotate on an axis. When we lose the ability to centrate our spine, for example, when we rotate, we end up having a lateral flexion, a shearing force that takes us off that optimal axis of rotation. And then we get those compensatory movements and that dysfunction. And generally, we'll have pain where we move too much. And that's where these people have these hypermobilities or create these hinges because they're so stiff in other areas of the spine. When we can develop proper alignment and intra-abdominal pressure, we are able to get long and create more optimal both alignment, but then again, rotation as well. And again, we talked about our client earlier, or my client earlier, he does not maintain an optimal axis of rotation of his hip joint or his spine, so that he overloads his spine because he does not maintain enough anterior pelvic tilt and a good centrated hip position. Centration, we need two components. Stabilization, we have to be able to stabilize some area. So we stabilize the spine, and then we dissociate or move under neuromuscular control, dissociate the hip from the trunk and pelvis, or dissociate the shoulder from the trunk as well. So we maintain this nice three-dimensional activation and respiratory breathing, or three-dimensional 
or diaphragmatic breathing as we dissociate the arm from the trunk or the hip from the trunk. And again, this is not just in the supine position, but this also applies to when we get into the upright position as well. Once we do that, now we take respiration, concentration, and add it into integrated integration. We teach our clients how to go through the fundamental movement patterns of squatting, lunging, pushing, pulling, bending, rotating, and walking while maintaining respiration while being centrated. This is the key to taking your clients from where they are right now and then incorporating the fundamental principles and getting them back to doing the activities they love. Because while we can argue core exercises, every exercise becomes a core exercise when you do these things here. When you teach a client how to breathe right, centrate right, and take them through the proper progressions, then we can create every exercise into a core exercise, whether you're doing a modified side plank, whether you're doing a push-pull pattern, whether you're pushing a sled, we can use these patterns and then progress them to their functional goals of living life, whether they just want to live their life and function with decreased, this, decreased pain and better function, or if they want to do and be active, like they want to run, ride their bike, or physically become physically fit and increase the intensity of their workouts. So what are our take-home messages? One, emphasize the principles. The principles of respiration. Make sure they breathe right. Centration, make sure they're aligned, can coactivate and dissociate their body appropriately at the right time under neuromuscular control. And then take that into the functional movement patterns, squatting, pushing, pulling, rotating, bending, and gait. Educate your client why they have low back pain. Educate your clients how to relax when they don't need to use their muscles. Educate your clients how to sit. Educate your clients on things that they can do when they go home. Educate them to why they have low back pain in the first pl place or common reasons why they have, they have low back pain. Educate them on strategies they can do in between their sessions with you. And always, always, always empower your clients. You're already doing a great job with that. Empower them. So many of my clients come in, my patients come in, and they tell me that the doctors don't believe they have low back pain or they think it's all in their head. Empower your clients. Teach them strategies to deal with and manage their low back pain. Teach them and you know, progress them appropriately so we're not being part of the problem of why they're having low back pain. When we do that and we serve others with confidence, integrity, and humility, we'll be rewarded, we'll make more money, we'll be the expert and that resource that our clients need, want, and we'll refer their friends and family to. If you're looking for further resources, sign up for our free e e resource, Fitness Insider, and get all our free video clips. We have over 50 video clips on our website, www.fitnesseducationseminars.com. Feel free to access those videos at any time and use them. We give you up-to-date corrective exercise strategies for training the general population because that's the clientele we work with. While we work with some of the best dancers and we work with athletes, we work primarily with the general population. and We develop strategies to work with this challenging, many challenging populations. We don't get to try these, these strategies on and develop these strategies on professional athletes. We work with the general population so that we know that they work for most individuals. If you want more resources, check out my book, Corrective Exercise Solutions to, to Common Hip and Shoulder Dysfunction. And again, of course, I go over in that book, even though it's about hip and shoulder primarily, we go over breathing. We go over thoracopelvic canister stabilization. We go over how to integrate that into improving hip and shoulder dysfunction. Because if the core is dysfunctional, if your breathing is dysfunctional, your movement patterns will be dysfunctional. And to keep you informed, to keep you having up-to-date resources, we got an important announcement coming from Fitness Education Seminars in the next couple weeks. So in the meantime, hope this webinar served you well. I hope it helped you become the expert or to help you develop yourself into the expert that your clients need and want. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great day. We'll catch you next time at Fitness Insider and Fitness Education Seminars. This is Dr. Evan Osar. Have a great day.